Book Two. Now, when young dawn showed again with her rosy fingers, the dear son of Odysseus stirred from where he was sleeping, and put on his clothes and slung a sharp sword over his shoulder. Underneath his shining feet he bound the fair sandals and went on his way from the chamber like a god in presence. He gave the word now to his clear voice heralds to summon by proclamation to assembly the flowing haired Acacians. And the heralds made their cry, and the men were assembled swiftly. Now when they were all assembled in one place together, he went on his way to assembly, in his hands holding a bronze spear. Not all alone, but a pair of light-footed dogs went with him. A theme drifted an enchantment of grace upon him, and all the people had their eyes on him as he came forward. He sat in his father's seat, and the elders made way before him. The first now to speak to him was the hero Aegyptios, who was bent over with age, and had seen things beyond number. His own dear son, Anthophos, the spearman, had gone off with godlike Odysseus to Ilion, land of good horses, in the hollow ships, and now the wild Cyclops had killed him deep in his cave, and this was the last man he had eaten. He had three other sons. One of them, Eurynomos, went with the suitors. The other two kept the estates of their fathers. Even so, he could not forget the lost one. He grieved and mourned for him, and it was in tears for him, now that he stood forth and addressed them. Hear me now, men of Ithaca, and the word I give you. Never has there been an assembly of us or any session since great Odysseus went away in the hollow vessels. Now who has gathered us in this way? What need has befallen which of the younger men or one of us who are older? Has he been hearing some message about the return of the army, which, having heard it first, he could now explain to us? Or has he some other public matter to set forth and argue? I think he is a good man and useful. So may Zeus grant him good accomplishment for whatever it is his mind desires. He spoke, and the dear son of Odysseus was glad for the omen, nor did he remain seated long. His heart was for speaking, and he stood in the middle of the assembly. Their herald, Pesinor, a man of deep discretion, put into his hands a scepter. First in answer to the old man, he spoke and addressed him. Old sir, the man is not far, but here. You yourself shall know him. It is I who assembled the people. To me, this grief comes closest, not that I heard some message about the return of the army, which having heard it first, I could now explain to you, nor have I uh, some other public matter to set forth and argue, but my own need, the evil that has befallen my household. There are two evils. I have lost a noble father, one who was king once over you here, and was kind to you like a father. And now here is a greater evil, one which presently will break up the whole house and destroy all my livelihood. For my mother, against her will, is beset by suitors, own sons and the men who are the greatest there hereabouts. These shrink from making the journey to the house of her father, Icarios, so that he might take bride gifts for his daughter and bestow her on the one he wished, who came in as his favorite. Rather, all their days they come and loiter in our house and sacrifice our oxen and our sheep and our fat goats and make a holiday feast of it and drink the bright wine recklessly. Most of our substance is wasted. We have no man here, such as Odysseus was, to drive this curse from the household. We ourselves are not the men to do it. We must be weaklings in such a case, not men well seasoned in battle. I would defend myself if the power were in me. No longer are the things endurable that have been done, and beyond all decency my house has been destroyed. Even you must be scandalized and ashamed before the neighboring men about us, the people who live around our land. Fear also the gods' anger, lest they, astonished by evil actions, turn against you. I supplicate you, by Zeus, the Olympian, and by Themis, who breaks up the assemblies of men and calls them in session. Let be, my friends, and leave me alone with my bitter sorrow to waste away, unless my noble father Odysseus at some time in anger did evil to the strong grieved Achaeans, for which angry with me in revenge you do me evil in setting these on me. But... For me, it would be far better for you to eat away my treasures and eat my cattle. If you were to eat them, there might be a recompense some day, for we could go through all the settlement with claims made public, asking for our goods again until it was all regiven. But now you are heaping me with troubles I cannot deal with. So he spoke in anger and dashed to the ground the scepter in a storm burst of tears, and pity held all the people. Now all the rest were stricken to silence. None was so hardy as to answer. Angry word against ang against word, the speech of Telemachus, it was Antinous alone spoke to him in answer. 
high spoken in temperament telemachus telemachus what accusations you have made in our to our shame trying to turn opinion against us and yet you have no cause to blame the achaean suitors but it is your own dear mother and she is greatly resourceful and now it is a third year and will be the fourth year presently since she has been denying the desires of the Achaeans. For she holds out hope to all and makes promises to each man, sending us messages, but her mind has other intentions. And here is another stratagem of her heart's devising. She set up a great loom in her palace and set to weaving a web of threads long and fine. Then she said to us, young men, my suitors now that the great Odysseus has perished, wait, though you are eager to marry me, until I finish this web, so that my weaving will not be useless and wasted. This is a shroud for the hero Laertes, for when the destructive doom of death which lays men low shall take him, lest any Achaean woman in this neighborhood hold it against me, that a man of many conquests lies with no sheep to wind him. So she spoke, and her proud heart in us was persuaded. Thereafter in the daytime she would weave at her great loom, but in the night she would have torches set by and undo it. So for three years she was secret in her design, convincing the Achaeans. But when the fourth year came with the seasons returning, one of her women, who knew the whole of the story, told us, and we found her in the act of undoing her glorious weaving. So against her will and by force, she had to finish it. Now the suitors answer you thus, so that you yourselves may know it in your mind, and all the Achaeans you may know it. Send your mother back and instruct her to be married to any man her father desires and who pleases her also. But if she continues to torment the sons of the Achaeans, since she is so dowered with the wisdom bestowed by Athene, to be expert in beautiful work, to have good character and cleverness, such as we are not told of, even of the ancient queens, the fair tressed Achaean women of times before us, Tyro and Alcmene and Mycenae, wearer of garlands. For none of these knew thoughts so wise as those Penelope knew. Yet in this single matter she did not think rightly. So long, I say, will your livelihood and possessions be eaten away, as long as she keeps his purpose, one which the very gods, I think, put into her heart. She is winning a great name for herself, but for you she is causing much loss of substance. We will not go back to her own estates, nor will we go elsewhere, until she marries whichever occasion male man she fancies. Then the thoughtful Telemachus said to him in answer, Antinous, I cannot thrust the mother who bore me, who raised me, out of the house against her will. My father, alive or dead, is elsewhere in the world. It will be hard to pay back Akarios if willingly I dismiss my mother. I will suffer some evil from her father, and the spirit will give me more yet. For my mother will call down her furies upon me as she goes out of the house, and I shall have the people's resentment. I will not be the one to say that word to her. But as for you... If your feeling is scandalized by my answer, go away from my palace and do your feasting elsewhere, eating up your own possessions, taking turns household by household. But if you decide it's more profitable and better to go on eating up one man's livelihood without payment, then spoil my house. I will cry out to the gods everlasting in the hope that Zeus might somehow grant a reversal of fortunes. Then you may perish in this house with no payment given. So spoke Telemachus. And for his sake, Zeus of the wide brows sent forth two eagles, soaring high from the peak of the mountain. These for a while sailed on the stream of the wind together, wing and wing close together, wings spread wide. But when they were over the middle of the vociferous assembly, they turned on each other suddenly in a thick shudder of wings and swooped over the heads of all with eyes glaring and deadly and tore each other by neck and cheek with the talons, then sped away to the right across the houses and city. And all were astounded at the birds when their eyes saw them, and they pondered in their hearts over what might come of it. And Halitherus, Mastor's son, an aged warrior, spoke to them. He was far beyond the men of his generation in understanding the meaning of birds and reading their portents. Now, in kind intention toward all, he spoke and addressed them. Hear me now, men of Ithaca, what I have to tell you. But what I say will be mostly a warning to the suitors, for a great disaster is wheeling down on them. Surely Odysseus will not be long away from his family, but now already is somewhere close by, working out the death and destruction of all these men, and it will be an evil for many others of us who inhabit sunny Ithaca. So, well beforehand, let us think how we can make them stop, or better let them stop themselves. 
It will soon be better for them if they do so. I who foretell this am not untried. I know what I am saying. Concerning him, I say that everything was accomplished in the way I said it would be at the time the Argives took ship for Ilion, and with them went resourceful Odysseus. I said that after much suffering, with all his companions lost in the twentieth year, not recognized by any, he would come home. And now all this is being accomplished. Then in turn, Eurymachos, son of Polybus, answered, Old sir, better go home and prophesy to your own children, for fear they may suffer some evil to come. In these things I can give a much better interpretation than you can. Many are the birds who under the sun's rays wander the sky. Not all of them mean anything. Odysseus is dead, far away, and how I wish that you had died with him also. Then you would not be announcing all these predictions, nor would you stir up Telemachus, who is now angry, looking for the gift for your own household, which he might give you. But I will tell you straight out, and it will be a thing accomplished. If you, who know much and have known it long, stir up a younger man, and by talking him around with words encourage his anger, then first of all, it will be the worse for him. He will not, on account of all these sayings, be able to accomplish anything. And on you, old sir, we shall lay a penalty, and it will grieve your mind as you pay it, and that for you will be a great sorrow. I myself, before you all, will advise Telemachus. Let him urge his mother to go back to her father's, and they shall appoint the marriage and arrange for the wedding presents in great amount, as ought to go with a beloved daughter. For I think the sons of the Cations will not give over their harsh courtship, for in any case we fear no one, and surely not Telemachus, for all he is so elegant. Nor do we care for any prophecy which you, old sir, may tell us, which will not happen, and will make you even more hated, and his possessions will wretchedly be eaten away. There will not be compensation ever while she makes the, the Achaeans put off marriage with her, while we, awaiting this all our days, quarrel for the sake of her excellence, nor ever go after others whom any one of us might properly marry. Then the thoughtful Telemachus said to him in answer, Eurymachos and all you others who are haughty suitors, I no longer entreat you in these matters, nor speak about them, since by now the gods know about this, as do all the Achaeans. And come now, grant me a swift ship and twenty companions who can convey me on a course from one place to another. For I am going to Sparta and going to Sandy Pylos to ask about the homecoming of my father who is long absent, on the chance of some mortal man telling me or of hearing a rumor sent by Zeus. She, more than others, spreads news among people. Then if I hear my father is alive and on his way home, then hard-pressed though I be, I will still hold out for another year. But if I hear he has died and lives no longer, then I will make my way home to the beloved land of my fathers, and pile up a tomb in his honor, and there make sacrifices in great amount, as is fitting, and give my mother to a husband. So he spoke, and sat down again, and among them rose up Mentor, who once had been the companion of stately Odysseus, and Odysseus, going on the ships, had turned over the household to the old man, to keep it well, and so all should obey him. He, in kind intention, now spoke forth and addressed him. Hear me now, men of Ithaca, what I have to tell you. No longer now let one who is a scepter king be eager to be gentle and kind, be one whose thought is schooled in justice, but let him always rather be harsh and act severely, seeing the way no one of the people he was lord over remembers God like Odysseus, and he was kind, like a father. Now it is not so much the proud suitors I resent for doing their violent acts by their minds, evil devising, for they lay their heads on the line when violently they eat up the house of Odysseus, who they say to themselves will not come back. But now I hold it against you, other people, how you will sit there in silence and never with an assault of words try to check the suitors, though they are so few and you so many. Then Leocritus, son of Eunor, spoke forth against him. Mentor, reckless in words, wild in your wits, what a thing you have said, urging them to stop us. It would be difficult even with more men than these to fight us over our feasting. For even if Odysseus of Ithaca himself were to come back and find the haughty suitors feasting in his house and be urgent in his mind to drive them out of his palace, his wife would have no joy of his coming, though she longs for it greatly, but rather he would meet an unworthy destiny if he fought against too many. You have spoken no purpose. 
Come then, all people disperse now, each to his own holdings, and Mentor and Halitherses will push forward this man's journey, since these from the first have been his friends, as friends of his father. But think, he will sit still for a long time waiting for messages here in Ithaca, and will never accomplish this voyage. So he spoke, and suddenly broke up the assembly, and the people scattered and went their ways, each to his own house, while the suitors went away into the house of godlike Odysseus. But Telemachus, walking along the sea beach away from others, washed his hands in the gray salt water and prayed to Athene, Hear me, you who came yesterday, a god into our house, and urged me to go on, on to go by ship over the misty face of the sea, to ask about the homecoming of my father, who was so long absent. Now all this is delayed by the Achaeans, and particularly the suitors and their evil overconfidence. So he spoke in prayer, and for nearby Athene came to him, likening herself to mentor and voice and appearance. Now she spoke aloud to him, and addressed him in winged words, Telemachus, you are to be no thoughtless man, no coward. If truly the strong force in your father is instilled in you, such a man he was for accomplishing word and action, your journey then will be no vain thing, nor go unaccomplished. But if you are not the seed begotten of him and Penelope, I have no hope that you will accomplish all you strive for. For few are the children who turn out to be equals of their fathers, and the greater number are worse. Few are better than their father is. But since you are to be no thoughtless man, no coward, and the mind of Odysseus has not altogether given out in you, there is some hope that you can bring all these things to fulfillment. So now, let be the purpose and the planning of these senseless suitors, since they are neither thoughtful men nor just men and have not realized the death and black fatality that stands close by, so that on the day they all must perish. And that journey for which you are so urgent will not be long now. Such a companion am I to you, as of your father. I will fit you out a fast ship. I myself will go with you. But now you must go back to the house and join the suitors, and get ready provisions for the journey. Pack all in containers, have wine in handle jars and barley meal, men's marrow and thick leather bags, and I, going round the town, will assemble volunteer companions to go with you. There are ships in plenty here in secret Ithaca, both old and new ones, and I will look them over for you to find out the best one, and soon we shall stow our gear and put out into the wide sea. So spoke Athene, daughter of Zeus, nor did Telemachus delay long after he had heard the voice of the goddess, but went on his way to the house, the heart troubled within him. He came upon the haughty suitors there in his palace, skinning goats and singeing fatted swine in the courtyard. Antinous, with a smile, came straight up to Telemachus and took him by the hand and spoke and named him, saying, High spoken, intemperate Telemachus, now let no other evil be considered in your heart, neither action nor word, but eat and drink with me, as you did in past time. The Achaeans will see to it that all these things are accomplished, the ship and chosen companion, so you may the more quickly reach sacred Pylos after news about your proud father. Then the thoughtful Telemachus said to him in answer, Antinous, there is no way for me to dine with you against my will, and take my ease when you are so insolent. Is it not enough, you suitors, that in pa time past you ruined my great and good possessions when I was still in my childhood? But now, when I am grown big, and by listening to others can learn the truth, and the anger is steaming up inside me, I will endeavor to visit evil destructions upon you, either by going to Pylos or remaining here in the district. But I will go. That journey I speak of will not be made void, but as a passenger, for I control no ship, not any companions. This, I think, was the way you wished to have it. He spoke, and lightly drew away his hand from Antinous's hand. But the suitors about the house prepared their dinner, and in their conversation they insulted him and mocked him, and thus would go to the word of, of one of the arrogant young men. Surely now Telemachus is devising our murder. Either he will bring some supporters from Sandy Pylos or even from Sparta, but he is so terribly eager, or perhaps his purpose is to go to Ephyre, that rich cornland, so that thence he can bring back poisonous medicines and put them into our wine bowl, and so destroy all of us. And thus would speak one another of these arrogant young men. Who knows whether when he goes in a hollow ship, he also might perish, staying far from his people, as did Odysseus. Were this, were this to happen, he would lighten all, of our, all, all our work for us. 
Then we could divide up his possessions and give the house to this man's mother to keep and to the man who marries her. So they spoke, but he went down into his father's high-roofed and wide storeroom, where gold and bronze were lying piled up, and abundant clothing in the bins and fragrant olive oil in the jars of wine, sweet to drink, aids were standing, keeping the unmixed divine drink inside them, lined up in order close to the wall, for the day when Odysseus might come home, even after laboring through many hardships. To close it, there were double doors that fitted together, with two halves, and there by night and day was a woman in charge, who, with intelligent care, watched over all this. Eurycleia, the daughter of Ops, the son of Pisenor. Now Telemachus called her to the room and spoke to her. Dear nurse, come draw me some sweet wine in the handled jars, choices of all you have in your keeping, next after you, what you have saved, are saving for the ill-fated man, the day when Zeus sprung Odysseus might come home, escaping death in its spirits. Fill me twelve in all, and fit them all with covers, and pour me barley into bags stitched strongly of leather. Let me have twenty measures of choice milled barley. You be the only one that knows this. Let all be gathered together, for I will pick it up in the evening after my mother climbs to her upper chamber and is ready for sleeping. For I am going to Sp into Sparta and to Sandy Pylos to ask after my dear father's homecoming if I might hear something. So he spoke, and the dear nurse Eurycleia cried out, and bitterly lamenting, she addressed him in winged words. Why, my beloved child, has this intention come into your mind? Why do you wish to wander over much country, you, an only and loved son? Illustrious Odysseus has perished far from his country in some outlandish region, and these men will devise evils against you on your returning. So you shall die by guile, and they divide all that is yours. No, but stay here and guard your possessions. It is not right for you to wander and suffer hardships on the barren wide sea. Then the thoughtful Telemachus said to her in answer, Do not fear, nurse. This plan was not made without a God's will, but swear to tell my beloved mother nothing about this until the eleventh day has come, or the twelfth hereafter, or until she misses me herself, or hears I am absent, so that she may not ruin her lovely skin with weeping. So he spoke, and the old woman swore to the gods a great oath, and after she had sworn to it and completed the oath-taking, she drew the wine in the handled jars at once thereafter, and poured his barley into bags stitched strongly of leather. But Telemachus went back into the house and joined the suitors. Now the gray-eyed goddess Athene thought what to do next. In the likeness of Telemachus, she went all to the city and, standing beside each man as she came to him, told them all to assemble beside the fast ship in the evening. Then she asked Nomon, the glorious son of Phronius, for a fast ship, and he with good will promised it to her. And the sun set, and all the journeying days were darkened. Now she drew the fast ship down to the sea in her stow, and in her stowed all the running gear that strong bench vessels carry. She set at the edge of the harbor, and around her the good companions thronged, and were assembled, and the goddess urged on each man. Now the gray-eyed goddess Athene thought what to do next. She went on her way into the house of godlike Odysseus, and there she drifted a sweet slumber over the suitors, and struck them as they drank, and knocked the goblets out of their hands, and they went to sleep in the city nor did any one sit long after sleep was fallen upon his eyelids. Afterward, gray-eyed Athene spoke to Telemachus when she had called him out from the well-established palace, likening herself to mentor in voice and appearance. Telemachus, already now your strong grieved companions are sitting at the oars and waiting for you to set forth. So let us go and not delay our voyaging longer. So spoke Pallas Athene, and she led the way swiftly and the man followed behind her walking in the god's footsteps. But when they had come down to the sea and where the ship was, they found the flowing-haired companions there by the seashore. Now the hallowed prince, Telemachus, spoke his word to them. Here, friends, let us carry the provisions. They are all ready and stacked in the hall. But, but my mother has been told nothing of this, nor the rest of the serving women. Only one knows the story. So he spoke and led the way, and the rest went with him. They all carried the provisions down and stowed them in the strong benched vessel in the way the dear son of Odysseus directed them. Telemachus went aboard the ship, but Athene went first and took her place in the stern of the ship and close beside her, Telemachus took his place. The men cast off the stern cables and themselves also went aboard and sat to the oarlocks. The goddess gray-eyed Athene sent them a favoring stern wind, strong Zephyros, 
who murmured over the wind, wine, blue water. Telemachus then gave the sign and urged his companions to lay hold of the tackle, and they listened to his urging, and raising the mast pole made of fur, they set it upright in the hollow hole in the box, and made it fast with four stays, and with halyards strongly twisted of leather pulled up the white sails. The wind blew into the middle of the sail, and at the cut water a blue wave rose and sang strongly as the ship went onward. She ran swiftly, cutting across a swell her pathway. When they had made fast the running gear all along the black ship, then they set up mixing bowls, filling them brimful with wine, and poured to the gods immortal and everlasting. But beyond all of the gods, they poured to Zeus's gray-eyed daughter. All night long, and into the dawn, she ran on her journey.